God bless you this week. Amen. Does he deserve our praise? Yes. I believe he does. Let's stand up and sing if you would. Heavenly sunlight. Good morning. My name is Robert Brock. I'm one of the elders here. A census taker once asked a little child, how many people live in your home? He replied, we are five. The census taker further questioned him, and who are they? The little boy began to name each one of family members. My dad, my mom, my sister, and I. The census taker noticed that the calculations of the child were off by one. 
the child counted again. My dad, my mom, my sister, and I. And then realizing that his math was off, he frowned and then cleverly shouted, Oh, and God! God should be part of every family. However, a census taker might not look favorably on such a family addition since God is not seen necessarily in the house. The first human family, however, had the blessing to count God among its family members. Adam and Eve enjoyed direct communion with their father. But then sin was introduced into the world and Adam, Eve, and their children observed the Garden of Eden from a distance, forbidden its enjoyment by angels with flaming swords guarding the entrance. They must have been devastated with the separation from God, not to mention the stewardship privileges of the garden now taken away from them. Abel gives believers the first lesson of stewardship. He was faithful to God's command by bringing an acceptable offering to God a lamb. Cain, however, disregarded God's command and followed the line of disobedience of his parents. Stewardship is obedience to God even when it does not make sense. May you choose today, like Abel, to be faithful as a steward of God's grace in our local church. Today's offering is for our local church budget. If you will notice in the back of the bulletin, we are a little short year to date in our church budget. We're just about 19,400 and some dollars behind in our church budget. Let's be faithful as God has blessed each one of us. All well, the deacons and deaconesses, please stand. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we have an opportunity to, to be stewards of all that you've given us. May we be faithful in returning our tithes to you and in supporting our local church. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
amazing opportunities with the special music and uh, Lord let your light just fits perfectly with the uh, theme for the day and, and a child being given to the Lord. What, what better dedication, what better way to praise God than look at our families and how we have a chance to tie our families to God. I want to look at the point of worship and say, Lord, here I am to worship you today, this moment. We want to open our hearts to you. We're glad that um, God's here to help us in connecting and realize that whatever happens, there's a chance of connecting, an opportunity of connecting with God. And we have that, that time to open our lives to Him. It was uh, incredible. We need this down just a little bit. It was an incredible opportunity for this eclipse to be seen by the family. And it wasn't that long ago, right? out there. It wasn't that long ago, right? An eclipse that's monumental. But, you know, the teacher, not in our school, but in this school, decided that for the little kids, there was too much chance of them ignoring it and looking up at the sun and damaging their retina. So she decided that she was going to take her little kids, the kindergartners, down into the basement where it was dark and black and then talk to them about the eclipse and do it that way so that they wouldn't chance ruining their retina. So as soon as the kids got out of school, the parents picked them up and came to the little girl, and mommy was so excited and said, well, honey, did you get to see the eclipse? She said, no, they took us downstairs and kept us in the dark. They wanted, us, they wanted to keep us in the dark because they were afraid that we were going to hurt our rectums. And I think that sometimes people are kept in the dark when they think they've got it all right. You know what I'm saying? They think they have the understanding of what's really going on when they're really still quite in the dark. In fact, that's part of what the Feast of Lights was all about. 
If you looked at the temple, it's highly polished marble surrounded by gold trim on every side. It glowed in the daytime, but at night, something magical happened. During the Feast of Tabernacles, the closing ceremony, the last day of the feast, everything was lit up in the Feast of Lights. So much so that it glowed from every angle. As the torches, some of the menorah, 75 feet high, four bowls on each of those menorah, with those, each of the bowls themselves carrying up to 10 gallons of oil, wicked with old priest robes and lit on fire. It really made it seem as if, as the light shined off of the temple, that the fire of God and the pillar of light had come back down to be with Israel in their presence. It was a time of rejoicing. It was a harvest feast. We talked about the Feast of Tabernacles in the first um, uh, part about two weeks ago, but this is the second aspect. There was the Feast of Libation that was part of the Feast of Tabernacles where the water offering was poured and where Jesus stood up and said, I am the living water. And everybody saw. But now, as the night dawns on that same day and everything is lit up, so bright, in fact, you can imagine it as if a thousand floodlights shined into the sky and it formed a tower of light that reached up and reflected off and down as well. It was so clear that it said that people could harvest right there present from the light of the sanctuary. An amazing thing and a parade of light, a festival. Anything that could be celebrated in righteousness was. There was eating. There was dancing. In fact, as they came in the parade of lights coming forward, they carried torches. And the priests themselves juggled torches as they came forward singing praises to the Lord. Amazing in looking at this fantastic, joyous celebration. But it wasn't like the rest of the feasts of the... Uh, nations around them. Although it was a harvest feast and a celebration, it had extreme spiritual significance. It had everything to do with not just celebrating a harvest time or, or recognizing that God had blessed them. It had everything to do with talking about the culmination of salvation history. Each of the feasts had pointed to one part of the history until this became the culminating feast, the Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Light, where God comes down to dwell with His people, where there's no more need for sun or moon, for the Lord Himself will be the light. And from His light, the tabernacle is set ablaze and the tree of life is restored. They believed that this would be the time of the Messianic Deliverer and they used this feast to symbolize the Messiah coming to deliver them and to set up the kingdom and to get rid of their enemies and to put them as Israel in the center of the world so everyone would come to them. In fact, they read at that feast, Zechariah 14, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. And when he fights on the day of battle, in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of of the Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley. And so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. Then the Lord, my God, will come and all His holy ones with Him. On that day, there will be neither sunlight nor cold, frosty darkness. It will be a unique day, a day known only to the Lord with no distinction between day and night. When evening comes, there will be light. They read this feast about the celebrating of the messianic deliverer that was to come. And now as they counted off time, it seemed to be the opportunity. And they were bringing praises to the temple, reading through Zechariah on that day living water will flow out of Jerusalem. We just talked about the libation feast, right? The pouring of the water. They believe this was there. And then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year and worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and celebrate the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles. This 
celebration. Everybody will come to the place where Israel reigns, where the Messiah is there, and all the enemies that were against him will have to come and celebrate and recognize that he is king. He's been in his rightful position. He's restored Israel to the kingship. And they were excited about the possibility. They were thrilled with what would happen. And in the center of this feast, as everything's coming together, Jesus stands up and says, I am the light of the world. It's not without a context. It's in the center of the feast as it's all coming down and they're looking for the coming Messiah. No one could miss His claim. I am the light of the world. You see, they believed the Messiah was going to come and set up His kingdom. And He was announcing, He's here. It's me. You can only imagine what's going on in the minds of the people. He's just said, just that same day, I'm the living water. And now He turns and says, I'm the light of the world. They don't have question that Jesus is proclaiming Himself to be at least the Messiah, but God Himself. Isaiah 49.6, He who follows Me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Light to the whole world. I am the light, not just of the Jews. I am the light of the world. They believe that everyone would come and he would be the one who was there and everyone would have to become a Jew. But Jesus says, I'm the light of the whole world. Isaiah 49, verse 6, He who follows me, um, it says, I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. I will also make you a light of the nations. Catch it? Nations, plural. So that my salvation what he's going to do in coming, will reach to the end of the earth. This was not, in his mind, a Jewish thing. He was announcing himself as the Lord of the whole earth. And that his coming would extend to everyone. But it's not new. He'd been announced as this light at his birth. Simeon, when he sees him come in, embraces the child who the priests have missed embraces the child and says, O Lord, let now thy servant depart, O Lord, according to thy word and peace. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, thy salvation, Lord, which thou hast given today, a light of a revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. A light as a revelation to the Gentiles. It was announced as he was dedicated in the temple, at that very first, at that very first date of Jesus coming to the temple was the announcement that he was going to be the light that filled that temple. That was declared the light of the world, that it was going to take up throne on the very temple where the Shekinah dwelt. Are you with me? Where the God's presence dwelt in this temple and Jesus steps in and he says, you are going to be the light of the world. John takes that image and repeats it. John, the writer of the gospel, repeats that image of light versus darkness and light coming in to penetrate the darkness over and over again through his gospel. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness didn't comprehend it. That's how he starts. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness couldn't comprehend it. How could they? How could they? How could How could darkness understand light? How could selfishness understand giving? How could somebody who's a taker understand somebody who's caring for others? How could evil grasp what it means to give of yourself for somebody who mistreats you? Righteousness and wickedness, they just don't get each other. They don't understand it. It's a foreign nature. I like NIV's translation. It says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not, and it uses overcome it. Not just comprehend it. It couldn't overcome it. And Satan tried, didn't he? To overcome Jesus. But Satan couldn't stop the light. No matter how much darkness you throw at light, light is not going to disappear. Light's power is to conquer darkness by its very nature. 
And ultimately, what it's going to be is when that light comes, each person is going to decide whether they cling to darkness and are destroyed with it, or whether they let the light purify them and destroy the darkness that's in them. And they let go of the darkness to the cleansing, purifying power of the light. Because our God is a consuming fire, a glorious presence, a God whose light will not be in the presence of darkness because by its very nature, it can't. And Jesus came, it says, to enlighten every man. That's the kind of light he came to share, was to help us to understand the truth of who God is and by that push out evil. I know that it's a hard concept because as you look through John, he uses light in a hundred different ways. Light as judgment. He uses light as a power source. He uses light as exposure of sin. He uses light in a lot of different facets as life itself, as the Son of Man rises. But in this sense, he's using it to say light comes like truth to dispel falsehood. All the lies that Satan has shared. Jesus comes to enlighten us about who God is and what he's like. And how he lives. And that is salvation for us. The understanding of who God is, grasping of his character, is our hope for salvation. Because it motivates us to turn to him. And that same light, it's like turning a flashlight into a roach-infested room. It's one thing to see the dirty evil. And then you have to decide what you're going to do. Are you going to look at that evil and deal with it? Or are you just going to turn off the flashlight? And what they wanted is to turn off Jesus as a flashlight so it wouldn't expose their sin. Because they didn't want to drag their sin into the light and have him deal with it. They were happier just turning him off. But he didn't just come to expose sin. He came to give us hope. Once he showed us that darkness, he came to give us light that we could move into the light and find hope in the light and be transformed by the light. He didn't just come to show us the evil in our life. He came to deliver us from the evil in our life. He like a tunnel in which we move forward until we find and finally walk into the light. Isaiah 9.1 says, But there will be no more gloom for who has anguish. He shall make it glorious. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Light prevails. Light moves forward. Jesus was here to give us the picture of God. And every day they could see who God was. When it says, and the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was the light, and that light was the life of man. Why would they connect those two things? It's because when the Word moves forward as light, as truth, it dispels darkness and falsehood. Jesus, the same thing, enlightening us about God, dispelled all the false concepts of who God was. Talked to us about deliverance. Told us about the issues of sin. God became a living light among them and walked among them. But it wasn't new. He'd been living among them as a light for a long time. The word Shekinah, the Shekinah glory. How many of you have heard Shekinah before? Okay. The word Shekinah is the Hebrew word that means he's caused to dwell. He's caused himself to dwell with us. The Shekinah, God's here. He's present. In the temple, it wasn't a make-believe God. It wasn't a light representing God. It was God. He's come as the Shekinah to dwell among us, light here in the midst of this darkness, and they had to veil it because it was so powerful that they couldn't walk into the presence of the light with their sin in their lives without being destroyed. So they put veils between them and the light until the true light would come. And as he stood there, all the representations of life that he gave them were there in the temple as they walked toward him. In fact, the menorah itself was seen as a tree of life, which is light. And they took the menorah and lit it up beautifully to show a tree of light. Representing the tree of life that was lost, that God would restore to everyone who turns to him. 
when I think of God dwelling with his people, I can't help but say it wasn't just in the tabernacle. From the time they left Egypt, shone over them, covered them and protected them with the pillar of light, showing he was present. And I've mentioned before that I've thought of that sort of like a nightlight, you know, kind of getting rid of the fears and giving us a little comfort that everything's okay. Um, getting rid of the boogeyman in the back because, you know, the light's here. I can see something. It's okay. But it was much more than just a comfort or a sense of his presence. It was a power. It was a force to deal with the enemy. That light was representing God's righteousness and that he was going to care for his people and that he was with his people even when others were against them. How do I know that? Because Exodus 14, 19, and 20 says, the pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them. Guess when the event is? When Egypt is coming to get the Israelites, the pillar moves from in front of them to behind them because they're up against the water and the other nation's coming and the cloud moves around and it moves in front of them. And then it says, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel, Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other. So neither went near the other all night long. Let us flee from Israel, said the Egyptians, for the Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians. So the light comes and is a force. It turns to darkness on their side and light on their side. It is a power that has to be reckoned with. They can't come through it because a wall of fire is there. That's God's power. We sometimes think of it as a nightlight, and it's true, but it's also delivering righteousness. It's a consuming light that will ultimately cleanse this world of sin and give us a place to dwell that's a land of pure light. And it's not just them, and not just back then. God wants to be our light now. He's already promised himself to us, to rescue us. To rescue us from our darkness and our hurt and our pain and our slavery and our enslavement to free us to a new place. Colossians 1.13 says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness. Now that sounds like light and darkness to me, doesn't it you? Notice it doesn't say he will rescue. He's hoping to rescue. It actually says he rescued, past tense. He's already done it. He's already dealt the death blow to Satan to give us deliverance and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. We've moved from one kingdom to another. We're no longer where we used to be. The light has come and the darkness has been dispelled. I think of it like Saul Saul had in his mind, and you can count Saul as a very enlightened man. He was well-educated. He was strong and powerful. He was in the top of the Sanhedrin. He would have even considered himself religiously superior. He was one of the elite. And he was bright in almost every way except in this. He hadn't seen Jesus Christ as Lord of his life. And so he was using all his power to destroy Israel. Anyone who in Israel chose Christ to destroy the true people of God. To promote a religion that was against Jesus Christ. And he moved forward to do just that. To ferret out any Christians and have their heads cut off. Put them in jail. And it was on that way to Damascus that God took this one who thought he was enlightened and showed him the true light. A blinding light. A light that opened his vision and gave him a new picture of things. A light that showed him that he had been wrong all this time. And gave him the opportunity to repent. And here's what he says to him. For this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you as a minister and a witness, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. He comes as a blinding light so that he fills him with light, so that he takes away his darkness, and then he says, and I'm calling you to be that same light. 
to go and transfer people from the kingdom of darkness to light, from Satan's domain to God's domain. I'm calling you to be my light, my ambassador to the world. Do you think he's changed his purpose in filling us with light? That it's not just to clean us out? That it's not just to purify our hearts, but also to power, empower us to go and share with others the hope of a light whose everything that's light itse- life itself, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and, and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me, and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. I stop and say, he called us to say that we live a life for him, that once we're filled with the light, once he, we've experienced the light ourselves, that we move out in light. All the way through John, he picks up those images. In 1 John, he talks about he walks in the light, no longer walks in the darkness. And he talks about the steps that we take to be like God. John 8, 12 says, He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but have the light of life. Will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Not walking in the darkness means that we don't live the same as we used to. Our lives are transformed. Matthew says that, Let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That they could see who you are are and see what's going on in your life and they glorify him because there's a light living inside of you. It's like you're glowing with the face of Moses as you've come from being in God's presence because God's penetrating through everything that you do. Psalm 37 says it, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. He will do it. It doesn't say go out and perform acts so that you glorify God. It says let God work through you to do those acts so that people can see the God who's working in your life. In fact, it says he will bring forth your righteousness as the light. He will bring forth your right. Let him do it. He will bring the righteousness forward as the light. His power, his strength, his ability, not ours. Sometimes we think that all we need to do is willpower ourselves to be better Christians. But it's saying, no, let me come in and dispel the darkness in your life. And your judgment will be as noonday. John 8, 31 and 32 says, If you continue in my word, then your disciples are truly, then you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, follow with me. He's gone on and said that when light comes, he delivers us from slavery, right? He moves us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Are you with me? So when he just uses the same phrase and you will, in the same passage, and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free, he's saying the same thing. That light is God's truth. The word, who God is, a revelation of his plan of salvation, an understanding of the difference between Christ and Satan, a recognition. He says that truth will give you life. Later he will say, it will sanctify you. It will set you apart. It will make you holy. The truth will sanctify you. Sanctify them in truth. My word, he says, is truth. When we see this light moving in, it means that truth comes and dispels all the lies of Satan. First, it points to us to say, it's not just your outside actions. It's your inner heart. You're wicked at the core. We need God to show us that. Because until that happens, we still try on our own power. We need God to say, no, I need to go deeper than just your outside actions. I need to go to what's inside because all those dark closets that you've locked darkness in, I've got to penetrate those too. He says, therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Notice he says, unless you believe, I am he. Notice that he is italicized. You know what it literally says in the original language? It says in Greek, if you would know that I am, 
Yahweh, I am God. Unless you know that I'm God, you're going to die in your sins. Unless you put me in my rightful place, you're going to die. He gave us a better picture of God. And then he stood and said, unless you take me as God, you're going to die in your sin. There's no other picture. Jesus was very serious about light penetrating darkness and then telling us that right now, when we start, we're in the darkness. And then he holds out and says, but I have hope. And it's me. It's who I am. They must accept Jesus as the I am, the true and eternal God. And he goes through all the book of John portraying himself as God. He starts by saying, I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the truth and the life. I'm the door. I'm the resurrection and the life. He goes through and says, I'm the vine. I'm the, uh, the resurrection. I, I am and they understand what he's doing is he's using the word that identified God in the Old Testament when he came in the flaming bush and said, God present in light. He said, that's me, the present tense God. And immediately when he makes these claims, there's a struggle going on with all the Jews that are there. Because they have to decide, what are they going to do with the one who claims to be Lord? What are you going to do with Jesus? It's the same issue today. They turn and said, you think we're slaves to sin? We're not slaves. Look at us. We're the elite. We're religious. We're the followers. We're the ones who come to church. We're the seventh day. I mean, the, we're the followers of Abraham, Abraham's offspring. Don't tell us. We don't need to hear that. We belong to the righteous heritage the one that will get us to heaven. We've believed all 28 fundamentals and we're surely on our way. And he says, you're of your father, the devil. You don't act like Abraham, you act like him. He was a murderer and a liar from the beginning and so are you. And he tells them, when you lie, you speak your mother tongue. And it's a really fitting picture because we often talk about speaking with forked tongues as being the time when we're not telling the truth. And the serpent is the one who speaks with the forked tongue. And that's where we got the saying from. You're speaking with a forked tongue to say, you're lying like he lied at the very beginning. And Satan still lies, doesn't he? God cannot be trusted. It's too late to be forgiven. Sin brings you pleasure, not death. You don't need God. You're a God yourself. God's going to overlook that sin. It doesn't matter. You just go ahead and do whatever pleases you. Satan continues to lie. And we need to confront him with the truth. So Jesus makes it even clearer than ever. They say, you're not greater than our father Abraham, are you? We follow him. And he says, before Abraham was, I am. And they knew exactly what he was claiming. And they picked up stones to kill him because he was claiming to be God. And at the very point, as he claims to be, I am the light of the world, everybody has to make the same decision. He's still making that claim, I am, right? What do we do with Jesus? What do we do with his claim? What do we do with the sin in our life that we're struggling?